So as Brian said, I am not a DASH privacy lawyer. I am a, an employment lawyer. I had the employment practice. Um, but I think I and the team find ourselves increasingly, and in fact, probably with every conversation we have with clients, warning them and reminding them that whatever they say and whatever they note and record, to the extent that it includes the personal data of their employees, that that personal data could be the subject of a subject access request by the employee. So Rob, like if an employee makes a subject access request looking for their own personal data, an employer has to then go and pull together everything from which an employee can be identified and provide it within a month. Am I right? Yeah, I think um, the technical legal term is utter pain when it comes to uh, a subject access request. Um, and expensive pain. <laughs> and expensive. Um, but yeah, no, so in terms of the information that you have to compile, it's anything really which contains personal data relating to the data subject. So that could be personnel files, emails, depending on the nature of the, the, the request, CCTV footage. Uh, it can even extend to you know, performance discussions on Slack, uh, redundancy planning tables. So really a lot of potential information. And I think redundancy as, planning tables. Like that's <laughs> been a big one recently because the names are going into boxes and that's something that we've had to remind people again and again about if, if you're planning a redundancy, just be careful about putting people's names in. Yeah, just always be careful about anything you write down effectively because yeah. you know uh, it is within scope. And I think also it's just, you know, it's an inevitability. As an organization, you're going to get subject access requests. And a good working assumption is if you've got one, there's a reasonable likelihood it's going to escalate to a complaint to the DPC. 42% of complaints last year were for subject access requests. So I think it's just a pretty healthy way to look at it. Um, and it's an area where there's actually increasing development. So the ICO issued their new guidance this week. The EDBB just a, uh, just a finalized their access guidance. The DBC updated theirs in October last year. There's lots of very recent uh, cases coming out at a European level. So it's an area where there is quite a lot of activity, and I think there will increase to be, because it really means everything for organizations, big and small. Um, and just in terms of some of those tips, like as I said a minute ago, do be careful what you write down. Um, the timeline, you can extend that. So normally it's one month, but you can actually extend it to three months. Uh, in certain cases, such as due to the complexity. So take that opportunity if you, if you can. Um, there's some helpful guidance from the DPC which reflects its practice, which is that work slash professional emails are generally considered to be out of scope. Um, and that's reflected in their new uh, workplace guidance. So that's kind of helpful. Similarly, things like calendar invites, because they don't relate to the individual, they relate to, to the work they're doing. One of the questions we often get asked about is what about the likes of WhatsApp? Um, and that's a difficult one, um, but I think what can help you in trying to say, well, we don't have any reasonable basis to look at our, our staff's WhatsApp messages, is to have a clear policy saying you shouldn't use things like WhatsApp for work-related conversations. And then just in practical terms, I think there's two things that you can do just to make it, make you better and more efficient at dealing with them. Firstly, is to have a, you know, a champion, someone who's the person who deals with them on a consistent basis because they're going to know how to deal with it. They're not going to be learning the curve every single time. And also just developing guidance. And I don't mean kind of generic guidance. I mean really practical guidance. Like, what did we, what did we search against last time? And just documenting that. What were the approaches we, take, we took to particular data and saying it's in or out of scope? And documenting that. And that's something you can kind of build up over time. But it can then become really effective in enabling you to respond quickly and, consist and, and consistently. One of the things that strikes me, Rob, as particularly difficult is that the same rules apply whether somebody's been with an organization six months or like me and Mason Hayes and Curran, 25 years. I mean, the size and scale of a response to a request made by somebody who's been with an organization for 25 years is just phenomenal. Yeah, it, it, it is a challenge. I think that's why I came up with that technical term earlier. Um, <laughs> One of the helpful things, though, in the GDPR is recital 63. Um, and that recognizes that in some cases where you process a large volume of data, you can ask the data subject if they can narrow down the request. 
And often the data subject actually is quite responsive to that because they're not necessarily interested in all the data you hold about them, they're just interested in certain data. So a good opportunity is at the first instance when you receive the request is to say, well, can you help us narrow this down? Can you help us set some search parameters or giving them some suggestions as to, as to how that might work? And helpfully, the regulators acknowledge that during that period where you're trying to clarify or agree the scope, time stops running. So that time period within which you have to respond is stalled. So that's kind of helpful first step. Um, but as you said, like, it is very challenging. The DBC's guidance is helpful in the sense that it says a controller shouldn't be able to, shouldn't be required to do searches that go beyond what is reasonable and uh, in terms of time and money. And the, the ICO, which is the UK regulator, they similarly kind of re refer to kind of what are reasonable or proportionate searches. But unhelpfully, the EDBB in their new access guidance says there's no principle of proportionality limiting the scale of what you have to do. And um, so it's not clear if the DPC is gonna maintain its position. It kind of think, looks like it may do though because their guidance was updated just in October last year at a point when the draft guidance of the EDBB was already out. Um, and it can definitely be argued that what the EDBB's position is goes too far and is inconsistent with some of the fundamental principles of EU law and just some of the, case, some, some of the principles coming out from some of the case law. And I think there's also, as, as I mentioned, there, there is this right to reject a request if it's manifestly excessive. And there's a really interesting case which came from the Belgian supervisory authority where just quite recently, the data subject was insisting that the uh, controller, the employer, uh, do a review of this shared inbox that they used to use. And the regulator decided that that was manifestly excessive. And that was because it was a shared inbox, the data subject, uh, which went back over eight years, and the data subject had refused to engage with them and try and find ways to narrow down the scope of the request in a meaningful way. So, so there is a little bit of hope at, at the end of the tunnel, um, but I think it's gonna be really interesting because what you see with that EDBB guidance compared to the DBC guidance, compared to the ICO guidance, is just discrepancies in approach. And we've also seen that in some of our cross-border work, we see the, that within different jurisdictions, the case law comes to very different conclusions. So it's an area where there actually isn't agreement. Um, and I think it really kind of comes down in practice to being able to show a positive narrative. And, and that's something I might come back to a little bit later. Well, keep on the practical piece there because um, I had to deal with a request recently that <clears throat> came in um, the day of a WRC, WRC hearing by an employee who'd been dismissed and was challenging their dismissal. And that particular employee had been with the organization seven or eight years, so not, not forever, but, but not kind of short. And I take your point about going back and trying to agree um, the parameters of trying to narrow down a, a discussion. But in the real world, particularly with a disgruntled former employee, that's not, not always a reality. The client gathered the docs, we had a look at them, there was something like 90,000 documents, like it was huge. And what we decided to do then was we just actually narrowed it down to the personnel file, the grievance, the redundancy process, and then the dismissal and the appeal. And we sent the documents redacted, and we'll come back to that in a few minutes as well, with an explanation as to what we'd included and, and a note to say, if there's something else in particular that you want, please come back to us. Now, I know that doesn't comply. That's not what we're supposed to do. But it felt like a reasonable and realistic response because actually we knew what she was looking for. And it wasn't, you know, her holiday request from 15 years ago or whatever, six years ago. Um, so far, fingers crossed, we haven't heard back from them. Um, is that, Rob, like... <laughs> really? Should I have gone to you first? <laughs> let me, let I know, me, I said, I did say I didn't think it was perfect, but... Let, let, let me answer a different question. <laughs> um, Uh-oh. No, I, no it, it is interesting because we get these requests and we know there's only one reason for them. It's someone looking to take a claim against us. Um, and there's a recent case in Germany, in Nuremberg, where the court there held that the fact that... So, actually, a little bit of history. So, there's a case called YS, which is a uh, European Court of Justice decision. And in that case, they said that the reason or the purpose of the right of access was enabled people to identify and verify the lawful processing of their data. And so in this Nuremberg case, the court said, well, the purpose of this request, uh, which related to actually finding out whether 
whether insurance premiums were being, increases in insurance premiums were being applied in a manner in accordance with German law. So the purpose of the request was directed to that as opposed to identifying and verifying the lawful processing of their personal data. So the court said on that basis that it was a manifestly unfounded request and that it was permissible to reject it. So there is this thing of where people are using claims or data subject rights for the purposes of claims unrelated to the processing of their personal data where there has been some sympathy at a court level. And what's also interesting is that that access guidance, it actually, was it's generally kind of pretty narrow in its interpretations, it doesn't rule out that possibility where it talks about use of data for the purposes of claims. Um, there is a recent Advocate General decision at a European level uh, in a case called um, FT versus DW. In that case, unfortunately, the Advocate General is leaning the other way and suggesting that the purpose doesn't really matter. Um, but when it comes to, you know, in, in the real world, like, so what, what do we do when we get an access request and we know it's for purposes of a complaint or a claim? I think one of the first things you need to do is, is to identify what data is really important, right? So what do we not want them to get? And let's focus on that. Let's put all our effort into that. So can we say that it's not personal data? Can we say it's covered by an exception? So be quite practical in the first instance of prioritizing what you're going to do. And then it's generally a good idea if it's a large request to kind of create a decision tree or a decision matrix so that you're consistent in how you're applying the logic that you've applied there throughout the request. So you have a kind of consistency in approach. Sometimes also what we've done is where in that YS case I mentioned earlier, uh, the CJAU recognized that you could provide a full intelligible summary. So sometimes rather than providing redactions of documents, what we've done in the past is provided summaries. That can be quite time consuming, but it can have benefits. So there's a recent, uh, there's been quite a few recent cases. There's a recent case called CRIF, where the court said there isn't a right of access to documents per se, but sometimes you do need to provide the documents or excerpts from documents so that the, doc so the, the personal data is intelligible, right? So that they can properly understand the data. So you kind of do need to be careful around that. I think the other thing just in the context of potential claims is, is building up that narrative, right? So even if you write to them and say, look, we're trying to be reasonable here, we're trying to see how we can do this in an efficient way and target what you want. If the data subject comes back and is just really uncooperative, well, you're presenting a narrative to the DPC if this gets escalated, or a court, as the case may be, of really trying to be helpful and engaging, whereas their response back is creating a narrative where they are just being obstructive and difficult. And you know, sometimes the case officer dealing with these things, you know, they're not the most senior people and they just are sympathetic to what is clearly an effort on your part to engage, um, whereas you know, they can see on the other hand, someone's being quite obstructive. So let me just recap. When an employer gets a subject access request, engage and see can you narrow, maybe Matt, don't make that decision yourselves, but um, engage if you can, seek to extend out the time from a month to three months, record the decision making. I actually think that's an interesting one. So you can show the logic behind, is there a particular way to do that, Rob? Like No, I think you need to like, so, so like often we just kind of will have like a little set of principles yeah. that you apply. So if you've interpreted something in a particular way, you just kind of document what that was. And then you get faced with the next, because sometimes you might have four or five people dealing with an access request given yeah. the volume of it. And if you're all creating a little decision tree, you kind of see the consistency of the logic. So it's just kind of, okay. Yeah. Focus your energy on the more sensitive elements, yeah. if you like, and explain your rationale. I mean, I think they're good practical tips. There's one other question on, on the whole subject of subject access requests from employees, just kind of, you know, when you get the 90,000 documents and, and sometimes it's not that many. And obviously, I mean, I think there are some things that can be excluded, like calendar invites and work emails. But then you're down into that job of, redacting other people's personal data from the emails, the attendances, the letters, the text messages. Any tips for how to deal with that? Yeah, so I think like the redaction exercise, unfortunately, is where the work is. It's not really the searches, like the searches sometimes can be, you know, time consuming, but really it's the work in actually redacting the documents where, where, where it all lies. And I think, you know, one of the key elements of that is, well, what is this concept of personal data? And there's a really simple test, which the courts have set down, which is, is the data linked to an individual by virtue of its content, purpose, or effect? So content, is it about them? Purpose, 
Are you using it to make decisions about them? Affect, does it have an impact on them? So if you keep that test in mind, it's quite helpful. And when it comes to data relation to other individuals, you can just literally exclude that. And then when it comes to like that example I gave earlier of the guidance saying that emails, work-related emails generally are out of scope, that's subject to the caveat where certain data may be related or personal data of the individual by virtue of its content, purpose, or effect. So you can't exclude all emails related to the data subject who's making the request, um, but you need to apply that test. And, and it is unfortunately quite a legal exercise. Um, and there's kind of no two ways about that, unfortunately. But there are other things that you can exclude. So you can exclude documents which are legally privileged. Um, one thing that we have seen the DPC do, though, is when you have purported to exclude documents on the basis of privilege, they've sent a schedule and said, well, identify all these documents, and then identify the basis on which all those documents are privileged. So it's almost similar to going through the exercise that you go through in court and trying to assert privilege. So you just need to be ready for that as well. And they can um, ask for copies of the documents over which you're asserting privilege. They have done, yes. but that doesn't yeah. necessarily mean that you're going to give them over. Yeah. Um, so more, it's more generally what you're doing is a description of the document so that they can ascertain whether it's privileged. But they do have a right to apply to the court then for a determination on privilege. And Rob, when the organization is then sending out the data, there is an obligation, and we've been living with this now for the five years, but there's an obligation to explain what personal data belonging to the employee is kept, why it's kept, the basis for keeping it, processing it, um, where it's kept and for how long. Now, I know because I've heard you say it, that if employers have decent employee privacy notices, they can point to the privacy notice rather than ha having to include that full explanation in the letter enclosing the, the, the or email or whatever it is, enclosing the, the personal data. But I know there's been some recent developments on that as, as well. Yeah, so, so, so your privacy notices could be designed to comply with your obligations under Article 13 of the GDPR. When you get an access request, you have to respond and provide the information set out in Article 15. And a privacy policy will capture a lot of that information, but it won't capture all of it. So a recent example is um, the post-AG case where the CJAU said that a data subject has a right to know not just the categories of recipients of their personal data, but in fact, the specific recipients of their personal data. So that's a big difference. Um, and that is the case unless it's impossible to, to provide that information or if you have a basis on which to actually reject the request more generally. And the EDBB in its guidance has said that the default is you need to provide the specific people rather than defaulting to categories and only providing the specific recipients on request. Um, another thing just to be conscious of in terms of dealing with uh, using your privacy notices, as Philip mentioned earlier, we had the, the WhatsApp transparency decision, which sets out really specific requirements for uh, a compliant privacy policy. So if you're dealing with, if you're gonna leverage your privacy policy, but equally you suspect that this is, a, this is gonna end up as a complaint to the DPC, do you really want to be bringing your privacy policy to the attention of the DPC? So you kind of need to be mindful of that. And one of the other areas where people always often struggle with their privacy policies is setting out the retention periods. And often it's an area where they're not that compliant. So again, you, know, you might want to think about, well, do we point to our privacy policy or maybe do we have an internal retention policy that we could refer to? But again, be careful. If you think it's going to be escalated up to the DPC, you might want to take a different approach depending on how compliant or non-compliant your, your retention policy is. And retention periods can be tricky from an employment perspective because different pieces of legislation provide for different records to be kept for varying lengths of time. It's different than for contracts, different for PI claims. So, so that is something yeah, the organizations yeah. should be over. Um, and, just, sorry, and just to say, like yeah. retention is a real key focus to the DBC because if you're deleting data, there's no privacy concerns. You've removed the data. So it is something they actually do focus on quite a bit. One issue for most employers is using CCTV footage and other maybe access cards for disciplinary purposes. I was telling um, Rob when we were preparing for this about a client of ours um, who was sure there was 50 euro gun missing from our handbag every Friday. Um, and she said what she shouldn't have done was she put in a, a, a little camera in her office and sure enough her PA was going in and opening up her wallet whipping 50 euro out every Friday afternoon. Um, and you know the employee made the right decision and decided to resign <clears> when she was shown the footage. But from a data privacy 
perspective, Rob. Yeah. A bit the, icky. Yeah. So Would that be right. <laughs> I think that is the technical term. Yes. Um, so yeah, when it comes to using CCTV footage, like one of the key things is transparency. So if you have CCTV cameras dotted around the place and you have these really prominent notices and they talk about how you're going to use the data for purposes of safety and security, and then you start to try and use it for disciplinary purposes, where you're immediately running into a difficulty because you've said you're going to use it for one purpose and now you're trying to use it for another. Now taking your example, you know, arguably security may relate to theft, right? So perhaps this is a case where it was, but I think you know, when it comes to disciplinary purposes for other reasons, it's more challenging. And also, um, I think in, in this case, there was a hidden camera, right? So it wasn't like prominent CCTV footage, but it was a hidden camera. And that's, like if you look at the new workplace uh, guidance from the DPC, covert monitoring is an area where they have a kind of particular focus on, and they really are against it. And if, if you are gonna engage in it, you really need to have done a documented analysis of the necessity for it and have set it out. So the guidance goes into that in quite a bit of detail as to, as to what they think you'd need to be doing. And, and I don't think that's, you know, they, in fairness, the DPC have been quite consistent about cameras over tails and yeah. taking pictures of sleeping security guards and all of that stuff. Um, there's one other question I want to ask you, and I want to make sure we've got some time for, for the Q&A from the audience, but the team and I, at the moment are up to our necks, as everybody will imagine and appreciate um, in severance agreements, particularly in the context of lots of the redundancies that are going on. And for most employers, when making payments on, on termination of employment, employees are required to sign a waiver. And one of the issues that we're debating a lot at the moment is whether when requiring an employee to sign a waiver, you can A, ask an employee to withdraw a subject access request, because you know sometimes if you rob on an employee's way out the door, is, is better spent than the, the same money trying to deal with the subject access request. So which all have a waiver, but then generally whether an employee in signing a waiver can waive their rights under GDPR and data privacy. And we've debated this a lot actually. And one of my points to Rob is that lots of employment legislation says that employees can't contract out of it. So the unfair dismissal, it's a choopy. They all say employees can't contract out of it. But the WRC, the High Court, the Supreme Court, they've all said, well, actually, if the employee is getting independent legal advice and they know what they're doing and they contract out of it in return for a sum of money, then we are going to uphold that. And that's been settled law for a long time. But you have a view on this as well in the context of particularly contract out of rights under data privacy legislation and GDPR. Yeah, so I think... There's obviously there's a practical element to this and there's a legal element, right? In practical terms, when you've reached the settlement, it'll frequently be the case that the person is happy to relinquish any rights that they have. Um, but there's always going to be those cases where they're not. And I think if it escalated up to the DPC, I'd be fairly certain that the DPC would take a position that they cannot contract out of that right. And you can see that in the recent ICO guidance. You can see it in the EWB guidance. I think the DPC would take the same position. As to whether the court would follow the DPC in that is a kind of interesting question. It's not something I'm aware of coming up, but you can see a court looking at wider public policy considerations in terms of trying to facilitate settlements and whether in those circumstances um, it may be different. And as you said, there is legislation, you know, other legislation, even yeah. the Commercial Agencies Directive, where you know, commercial agents, which are kind of almost considered to be quasi-employees, can contract out a certain right. So, you know, it's not- With the benefit of advice. With the, yeah, yeah, I think if you're gonna yeah. do it, I think it would yeah. be important to bring out the fact that they have had independent advice and capture that in the, in the settlement. So it's quite conceivable and maybe not entirely unexpected that the DPC's office might take a different view to- I think, I think the Supreme a high certainty. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I want to turn to some of the questions and thank you, we've got some great questions here. So Rob, here's one for you. How does an employer determine what is and is not excessive in terms of time, cost, resources, which have to go into responding to a subject access request from an employee. Like that's the multi-million dollar question, isn't <laughs> yeah. it? Yes. Yeah, I think that's a difficult one and a good question. Um, I think that look, the start, like, again, you've got to be practical. The first thing you're going to try and do, you, you need to try and narrow it down. Um, and you know, in a lot of cases, you're not, not going to succeed, but then you're, at least you're building up your narrative around it. But then you need to look at, well, if we're getting lots of, like, so, so when you're trying to narrow it down in the first instance, for example, you need to have done some searches. You don't just write and say, this seems really broad, you know, let's make it narrower. Like a good thing to do is actually say, well, we've done these searches and we've got like 30,000 hits for this and 40,000 hits for this, and this is gonna take a lot of time. So, you know, you're building up your narrative from the start, showing how reasonable you are. 
if they don't engage, um, well, then you need to kind of, you need to be quite, you know, you can't, you can't just say we're getting loads of, loads of responses to these hits and we can't do anything about it. You need to actually be clever about it and say, well, look, for this category of data, can we take a different approach for our search terms, for example? And for this category of data, maybe we use a broader one because it's, it's less likely to have a hit and it's more defensible to use kind of uh, search terms that will come up with less hits. So you need to kind of be quite clever in terms of your approach. You need to document that approach. The DPC is helpful in their guidance in terms of saying, look, there is, you know, they do recognize there's only so far you need to go. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, there is that risk that you know, the, the EDBB's guidance doesn't allow for proportionality. So I don't think there's a hard and fast rule, but I think, I think the key thing in all of this really is trying to build up a narrative around what you're doing and what's reasonable, showing that you've really tried to be responsive, that you've tried to come up with good ways of doing it. And then ultimately, you just have to take a position and you have to run with that. Um, we are completely out of time, but we have a load of questions. I'm going to ask you a very, very... Sit back down, Philip. <laughs> <laughs> Two, three bullet points on what should and shouldn't be redacted when preparing to hand over personal data to an employee's. Okay, so. Uh, you, Rob. Yeah, three bullet points. Okay, any personal data relating to other people, get rid of that. Um, anything legally privileged, get rid of that. Uh, trade secrets, IP that goes. Um, and I think just generally speaking, just exclude all work emails. Um, but having to do that search, I said about well, do we think it's a random content purpose or effect? But generally speaking, you're going to like just pure work emails that, that's just not going to include personal data. You can just get rid of that. And that will already have the effect of reducing. That's going to reduce yeah. then what you have yeah. to actually go through in detail. Thank you, Rob. I've learned loads this week from Rob. I'm now a bit of a data privacy lawyer. I'm going to ask Philip to come back up to the stage.